So it's, it's really an immense pleasure to have Joel Pinot here today. Um, Joel is a professor at McGill University, a core academic member at Mila um, in Montreal, and the co-managing director of Facebook AI research. Joel's work really ranges from fundamental algorithmic contributions to solving, solving real problems in robotics and healthcare and conversational agents. Um, Joel and I actually were um, part of um, uh, the NSERC Canadian Robotics Network, and I still remember her wheelchairs autonomously navigating in a shopping mall. So this was very impressive and was quite a few years ago. So um, we have invited Joelle because she has been really the driving force behind um, reproducibility efforts in reinforcement learning and um, has really pushed the community to look at this problem. And so we can probably as a robotics community learn a lot from her in terms of how we can make um, algorithms more reproducible. I got some slides in the room. We have slides on Zoom. Yeah. You can hear me in the room. Can you hear me on Zoom? I think it's, it should be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are all set. All right. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, really great to have a chance to talk about this topic, which I'm quite passionate about. Glad to have other people who are also interested in this topic. I'll probably take us on a bit of a different path than a lot of the um, discussions today in the workshop, but I think in the spirit of really exploring widely in a workshop, this may be useful. Um, and in particular, I'll try to draw on some of what's been going on in the machine learning literature and community with respect to these topics. And then maybe in the panel or later on through the day, we can have some discussions of what pieces of this might be useful to bring into the robotics community in years to come. So just to connect these pieces a little bit more concretely, the reason I care about reproducibility, the reason I've been pushing for changes to our practices across research community on this topic is because there's a direct link for me between reproducibility and robustness. By being able to have research findings that are reproducible is really a needed condition that we have towards having findings that are believable, findings that we can rely on, that we can then integrate into real world systems. So this is really where the motivation comes from. There's different terms that are used across the literature. And so this is one particular mapping that I'm using. I just want to warn that other people may be using these terms a little bit differently. I don't think we have to get too obsessed by picking a specific definition and always having only one. You know, There's still a lot of discussions of how to frame these questions, but for the purposes of today, I'm going to use this rough framing where reproducibility is much more about using the same code and analysis and using the same data, we should be getting the same results. Of course, what we're tending towards is this notion of generalizable systems. When you can afford to change the plant, change how the system is set up, change the data itself, and still have results that are consistent with your hypothesis, with your expectation. So it's a journey. Right now I'm spending a lot of my time focusing more on the reproducible side because that's a necessary step towards the other. But of course, where we want to go is towards generalizable intelligence systems. Some of my motivation comes from very early days. I have done some robotics in earlier days, including building wheelchair systems, as Angela alluded to, building some uh, robots for nursing care facilities and so on. All of this work um, was done really in very experimental setting. Um, we didn't always take it all the way towards the target population. But in all of this, you know, it was, it was clear that in many ways that the, the brittleness of the system was still there. It was very much experimental platform. The primary uh, machine learning algorithms we use on these systems was reinforcement learning. So most of my observation and analysis are in the context of reinforcement learning. That is where I do most of my research on the more theoretical side, but I think there's good implications for people who are using other sets of machine learning techniques. Some of these projects go back quite a few years now, and, and in my trajectory of research, I've also had the opportunity to do a lot of work on applying similar techniques towards healthcare systems. And, and the reason I bring it up today is because I think there's a lot of similarities between 
some of these more navigation-based robotic system and some of these healthcare systems. This is an example of one that we built a few years ago now. The idea was to build um, neurostimulation devices for patients with epilepsy. So this has all the characteristic of a robotic system. There are some electrodes implanted in the brain that read the electrical signal, EEG signal in real time. The device is responsible for delivering electrical stimulation at different uh, frequencies. And so you can adjust the timing of the pulse. You can adjust the amplitude of that signal. The role of that signal is to disturb the hypersynchronization of the neurons in the brain. So someone who has epilepsy, the neurons tend to get coordinated in terms of when they fire. And the effect of that neural stimulation is to send a signal that forces some local neurons to fire. And that reduces their ability to be recruited in a broader pattern of synchronized firing. And so there was already results in the literature showing that stimulation could be effectively disturbed by neurostimulation. Most of these devices were acting on an open loop control system. So someone would set the parameters and then you launch the thing and sort of hits the signal at repeated intervals. There's a mechanical manual way to change that setting, but it's not automatic. And so when we came into the project, the hypothesis was that through reinforcement learning, we could in real time adapt the timing of the stimulation to the live activity in the brain, including in some cases sort of probing the system to see the excitability and see if we needed more. And we saw the excitability was high to drive the system more to deplete some of the chemicals that are enabling the firing. And so this was an ambitious project. We did all of this work in an animal model of epilepsy, not with live patients. This was an in vitro model. So in this case, you take the slice of a rat brain, you put it in a solution where it's preserved from the order of four hours, and you can plant your electrodes there, observe the system, stimulate, and so on. So it's a lower risk system, of course, than either a live animal or a human yet it has a lot of the complication of a real life system. And when we started this project, you know, you take a project like that, you sort of look to your literature, you have this idea of doing reinforcement learning for this, but then you look at the literature, there's a tremendous amount of methods, none of which of course have been tested in anything that looks anywhere close to the system that we have at hand. And the number of papers in reinforcement learning really quickly growing most of this work, as you know, is tested in simulation systems, the Atari benchmark, the Majoko benchmark, these kinds of things, if you're lucky, otherwise some kind of simplified maze system. And so there's sort of a three step in this, in this process, right? All the papers and the algorithms are tested on these simulation environments where we have on the order of millions of samples to learn the policy that we want. In our case, we want to do preliminary testing in another model, this animal model. I don't know if that's and so, you know, there's, there's the original, the, the real simulation, but in a sense, the animal model is another level of simulation compared to the real system that you want. And so for each of these types of system, you have different ability to collect data, you have different tolerance to risk in each of this, and you have different evidence coming from the literature also. And so this is really the, the reason why, you know, having findings that in each of these settings are as transparent as possible about the results and about the performance of the system becomes really important so you can make the best assessment of what to use. Given the short time we have today, I'm not going to, oops, no, I'm not going to give you the long story of, of what we did in all of this project. I really want to reinforce the kinds of settings that we're looking at to motivate where these questions of reproducibility and robustness matter and come from the work that I've done. And so once the whole story was done, you know, we had spent about six months collecting the initial data in these slice models. We had eight slices, which live on the order of three or four hours. So it's not a lot of data. We spent another six months building batch reinforcement learning algorithms. So using that as a sort of static set of data, we didn't do online learning in this case. It was just too complicated to do. We got the best policy we thought, we crossed our fingers, we went back to the lab and we deployed the policy just for validation. So all we were doing at this point, no more learning validation. It took two years to do validations on 12 slices of this particular model for many complicated reasons, but that's sort of the piece of experimentation that we have to deal with. So in some sense, we had better be really sure of what we were doing in the early phase 
because we weren't going to get a second chance at that for a really, really long time if that did work. And so fortunately for us, actually, we got the result that we had hoped for, um, and we were able to show some, um, some improvement in performance compared to some of the baseline methods. Um, but it was a big gamble to try to do that. One of the reasons this work is difficult and we are seeing so many robustness problems in the reinforcement mm -hmm. learning literature is because there's so many sources of variation, particularly when you start bringing in deep learning models into your system. To be totally frank with you, we didn't use deep learning techniques at all. What we use is mostly random forests to learn the value function that we needed for the system. And the reason we use that is because random forest has very few parameters. Literally, we had like three parameters to set. And they're very, very robust to the setting of these hyperparameters. So you change them a little bit, the results basically stay the same. And so that meant we didn't need to waste any of our data for exploration of this really large hyperparameter space. We could take all of the data to learn the policy that we needed to. So once you look at all of that, you have to remember this whenever you read some of the papers in the literature that have been tested with some of these methods. And we did a lot of follow-up study with some of the papers in deep learning, trying to reproduce the results. And what we saw, you know, on the, both of these are Majoko results, so the kinds of things that you can afford to run thousands of simulation. On top of that is a class of algorithms called TRPO, which is quite widely used on the bottom, DDPT, another quite widely used. The only thing that differs in each of these graphs between each of the different colored lines is what's the implementation. And we didn't do any of these implementation. We actually went ahead and grabbed a few implementation available on the web, which is what many people do these days. And so the difference in performance between all of them was quite shocking. And most of this can be attributed to different setting of the hyperparameters. But if you're not really aware of all of the ways to set the hyperparameters to go and check all of these factor variations, if you don't have enough data to validate a good set of hyperparameter for your setting, in many ways you may want to stay away from these methods. Because without that ability, the performance can vary drastically in a way that you may not be aware of. The other thing that gets quite tricky with this is that in many cases, the performance is reported sometimes as just a single point. Sometimes there's some measure of variance, but the definition of that measure of variance is not always provided. I've read full papers where they don't, they have beautiful little gray, gray zones around their lines, but they don't define what's the statistical measure that they use to plot this. Usually I prefer the, the confidence interval, which gives you a notion of, um, of course, confidence. And in this case, what we had seen is a creeping pattern in the literature that in computing these confidence intervals, people were taking just the top results, not the whole set of results, which of course is very tempting. You know, anyone who has run a live system, you have many more failures than you have successes. And all of these failures don't always get accounted for in presenting the final result. Let me be very clear about what happens when you do that, right? We ran on the left side 10 different experiments, and on the right side, we just picked the top three of these experiments, which unfortunately has become a common practice in some of the reinforcement learning literature. What you see, of course, is a positive inflation of the estimate of your results, and secondly, a much smaller estimate on the variance of these results. And so there's really a need to be accountable for all of the data that we produce, not just the optimistic scenario otherwise, we risk having misleading results, which in some cases could have actually quite problematic consequences. So I think, you know, looking at a situation like that, I don't like to be only the bearer of bad news. I think it's important to actually really engage and decide what are the strategies that we can propose for our community to improve on this front. And so these are a number, I've started talking about this topic around 2018, and these are a number of the steps that have been brought into the machine learning community since then. The first one is that there's now a code, an explicit code submission policy at most of the conference. It doesn't mean that everyone needs to submit code, but there's an expectation that for the most part, people do submit code, that the code has some certain properties that allow the verification of the results. And for me, the most useful analogy for why we need code is with respect to some of the mathematical results. You know, no one would think nowadays, maybe in the old days that was common, but nowadays no one would think of proposing a mathematical theorem 
without the proof of that theorem. That would not stand. And so in a sense, this is a bit the analogy I have in this case for someone who has empirical results. The code is essentially the recipe for obtaining these results. So in terms of transparency and accountability of our results, that's an important component. If you go to archive now, and since the last year or two, there's actually a code tab that is available. So with the paper, you have the opportunity to get the code all in one place. This is something that we did through discussions with the Archive Foundation to try to bring that in. We spun that up first for the machine learning community, but since then it's been extended to several of the other communities covered by archive. Again, making the discoverability of the code along with the paper easier for everyone. There's a lot of tooling that's been developed that enables encapsulation of code and results. Coda Lab, Docker are some of the ones that we use, but there's lots of new ones that have some interesting characteristics. I encourage people to really consider them, integrate them into their workflows. We have an ML reproducibility checklist that we proposed. We proposed the first version. It has evolved a little bit over the years. The most recent version of the NeurIPS conference deadline was just recently last week. They had the brilliant idea of actually integrating the checklist right into the paper submission template. This is Appendix A for all papers. And so that means there's an expectation that people include that reproducibility checklist as part of their submission. We run a reproducibility challenge. Uh, we now cover seven conferences, including NeurIPS ICML, iClear, CVPR, ECV, ACL, EMNLP, I think roughly, uh, mostly in vision, language, and machine learning. Of course, in robotics, the presence of physical systems makes that harder. For those of these conferences, the big results are based on open source data sets, which makes it easier. But in these challenges, Groups of researchers across the world take a paper that was published in the last year. They take on the task of reproducing some or all of the results in that paper and writing up a reproducibility report testifying to how much they were able to reproduce what's in the paper itself. And so that provides a lot of really valuable insight into the work. Most of the people participating in this challenge are graduate students taking classes in machine learning or related fields. It's a great opportunity for them to get their hands directly on some of the newest research. And for the last uh, three years now, we published an annual issue of the journal Rescience with the best of the reproducibility challenge reports. The quality of these reports has really been climbing and we now um, make that option available for people who write a great report to actually get it published, which is a really nice opportunity. So I think there's a lot of things that are happening. Some of that is sort of embedded into these practices of the community. And I would also say um, it's, it's, um, it's also become much more top of mind to people in terms of how they do their work and how they review the work. The last one I'll mention that I think is an important development also, and, and maybe quite applicable to robotics, is the increasing use of model cards to describe components of an ML system. And so there's sort of a taxonomy of how you describe the different components of your system that really in this case increases the ability to be transparent about this. And so I'm really pushing in particular for the work I work um, part of my time at Meta, previously Facebook, and I'm really pushing, we've been open sourcing most of our work that whenever we release these open source, we include the model card with that to enable really that level of transparency. And I encourage others to think about it. Let me close with just a few last thoughts, just bringing it back to some of the major topics of the workshop and things that maybe will be useful to keep in mind. A lot of the focus in reinforcement learning and their use in robotic system has been on exploration versus exploitation. There's really this trade-off that is well established for at least three decades in this uh, literature. And we have tons of paper that talk about this trade-off. Some of them talk about it in very theoretical terms with bounds on sample complexity. Some of it talk about it in very practical terms with examples of the Floyd system. And I feel we really need to break out of just this one dimensional trade off between performance and efficiency. And so, you know, I think today in this workshop, we have the opportunity to include safety as part of that conversation. I think Angela's opening remarks made that very clear, as well as some of the follow up talks that we'll have. I also think we need to broaden that to other characteristics of system, whether it's questions about security, fairness, privacy, transparency. All of these are desirable properties of the systems that we are building, that we are deploying. 
And we have to be thoughtful about how we integrate some of these properties into the system that we build at the algorithmic level, at the hardware, at the software level as well. And so this is just maybe just an opening to some of the conversation on the topics that we might have throughout the day. Thank you very much.